morning, everybody. My name is Julie Panessi, Ethics Scholar for the Democracy Fund. It, it is a great pleasure. It is a great pleasure to be able to welcome you here tonight. Those of you who are here in our live audience, and I want to extend a special welcome to those of you joining us from home via Zoom. It is, to be honest, a bit surreal being here tonight. Almost unimaginably, just a few months ago, our government prohibited us from gathering to talk about our rights as Canadians, our challenges, needs, and fears. And so we did so with our friends for at at a Christian college who are true defenders of free speech and for whom we are very grateful. <laughs> the last two years felt more like something out of a dystopian novel than a Canadian reality, and yet it was all very real. And though we seem to be moving through the intensity of the crisis, we are here tonight because we've learned the hard lesson that even in Canada, freedom cannot be taken for granted, and that we need to keep discussions about our civil liberties front and center if we are to have a chance of holding on to them. We are just coming off of a very big couple of weeks for our country and for the Commonwealth generally. We saw the appointment of a new Prime Minister in the United Kingdom and the election of a new leader of our Federal Conservative Party. <laughs> Time will tell on that one, I think. <laughs> and of course, we lost the longest serving monarch Britain has ever and quite likely ever will have. Elizabeth II was a true leader, and leaders in the truest sense of the term weave people together in spite of their differences rather than tear them apart on account of those differences. One of my favorite quotes from the late Queen, and it seems timely, I think, and fitting to quote her tonight, is, when life seems hard, the courageous do not lie down and accept defeat. Instead, they are all the more determined to struggle for a better future. <laughs> These days, we find true leaders not in our highest offices, in our university classrooms, or in the bylines of our national universities, but in the form of alternative media and citizen journalists, whistleblowers, conscientious objectors, writers, artists, and historians who bear witness to our collective moral catastrophe, who ask the questions others are simply too afraid to ask, who drive us toward truth, and who act as our moral conscience, urging us to do better. We are very fortunate to have some of these people here with us tonight members of the media who keep watch and keep questioning and defending freedom of expression, even when their colleagues seem to have fallen asleep at the wheel. We have Harrison Faulkner from True North News. I don't know where. <laughs> we have, I believe, though I haven't seen him yet tonight, Joe Warmington from the Toronto Sun. <laughs> We have Rupa Subramanya from the National Post. Where, where are you, Rupa? Can you put your hand? There's Rupa. <laughs> and we have members from Rebel News as well. And a very special guest, a woman who lives and breathes the principles of freedom and accountability you probably know who I'm talking about, Tamara Leach. Tamara, does that happen when you go to the grocery store too these days? <laughs> 
And though I'm a bit biased, we are also very fortunate to have organizations like the Democracy Fund or TDF born from the need to preserve our fundamental constitutional rights, freedom of conscience and religion, of thought, belief, expression, of peaceful assembly and association. TDF is a registered Canadian charity and civil liberties organization founded in 2021 that aims to promote these rights, advance education, and relieve poverty through advocacy, education, and strategic litigation. On the education side, TDF supports myself as the ethics scholar, Bob Moran, the British civil liberties cartoonist, and Conrad Black, our historian in residence. On the legal side, we have a dedicated and very talented group of in-house lawyers and external counsel, which allows us to provide services to Canadians whose civil liberties have been infringed at no cost to themselves. Every day, I see our legal team working tirelessly to defend our clients in ways that make very real differences to their lives. This work has prevented people from losing their jobs or being de-enrolled from university. It has kept people out of prison, and it has prevented the hefty fines that would make it hard to keep one's home or even one's relationship together. Before we get to the main event of the evening, I would like for you to hear firsthand about some of the amazing work of our legal team. With us tonight, we have Senior Litigation Counsel Mark Joseph. There. <laughs> Our lead paralegal, Jenna Little. Jenna, if you're here, can you put up? <laughs> and our director of litigation, Alan Honor. <laughs> Alan practices in the areas of civil, criminal, and constitutional litigation. He has been a lawyer since 2011 and currently serves as TDF's litigation director. Alan will be representing TDF at the upcoming public inquiry into the federal government's invocation of the Emergencies Act. Please join me in welcoming very dear friend, Alan Honor. Hi, everyone. I'd just like to take a few minutes to tell you about some of the legal work that we're doing at TDF and some of this legal work which is made possible by the generous donations that you've all made. First of all at TDF, we have the type of lawsuit which I like to think of as the strategic lawsuit. This is where we go to court and we bring an application because we think we can make a difference. Let me give you an example. On Monday of this week, my colleague Mark Joseph joined forces with a lawyer named Lisa Bildy and an academic named uh, Bruce Party, and they challenged the University of Western Ontario's booster mandate. They said that... <laughs> they said that the university can't enforce this mandate because it's illegal for them to collect this information from their students. And if you're interested in that case, keep in touch with us because we expect a decision soon. In another case, we've challenged the ArriveCan application in the Federal Court of Canada. <laughs> I, I won't go into the details, but we're saying that the government didn't pass this law properly, and if they did, it's completely opposed to our charter rights, which protect, uh, which protect privacy. In another case, which you might remember, we defended a man named, Ar named Arthur Pavlovsky. <laughs> Pastor Pavlovsky was convicted of contempt for not obeying a public health order. But not only was he convicted of contempt, he was also given a script by the judge. He was told that he had to recite this script every time he spoke in public. And this script just happened to be opposed to everything he was believing, everything he was even speaking about. So, yes, indeed. With your help, we partnered with a lawyer named Sarah Miller. We took this case to the Alberta Court of Appeal, and Pastor Pavlovsky was completely exonerated. And 
Not only that, but it turns out that this script that the judge gave him was actually unconstitutional. Now, you can read uh, more about our cases on our website. You can read about how we're going to the Public Order Emergency Commission, and hopefully we'll find out why our Prime Minister uh, really invoked the Emergencies Act. <laughs> Before I get off the stage, I'd like to just tell you about some of the other cases we do. And I think this is actually the most important work we do. This is where we help individual people. My colleague, Adam uh, Blake Gallipo, he's in court almost every day fighting for people who have been charged criminally when all they really did was attend a peaceful protest in Ottawa or in Windsor. Or we have my colleague, Jenna Little. Uh, Jenna, I don't know if you're here, and I, hate, I would hate it if somebody did this to me, but can you stand up for a second if you are here? There she is. Jenna leads... Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about Jenna. She leads a team of four paralegals here in Ontario. They're representing over 1,300 people. And, you know, we sat down and we did the math, because she's, she's helping people with quarantine tickets, with masking tickets, with gathering tickets. And we've discovered that she has saved Ontarians uh, over $11 million in fines. So thank you, Jenna. And I, I just wanted to tell you about something that, that you won't see. I know whenever we get one of these tickets uh, withdrawn, uh, people will come back to us and there is just such a wave of relief that they experience. These are families who are maybe making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. They're faced with five dollars to $10,000 in, 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 in uh, fines and it makes such a difference to them. And you should know that. And thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the conversation tonight. I'm really glad you guys got to hear from Alan. You know, our lawyers are it amazes me how they keep their spirits up and things are going a bit better these days but you know eight, eight months ago when everything was so bleak and abysmal and they would show up every day and they're so dedicated and they're the kindest most generous people and uh, you should feel good knowing they're working for us every day so <laughs> and now now we're gonna get on to our main event of the evening it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our next guest who hardly needs an introduction but I'm gonna give him one anyway. <laughs> he is a financier and an esteemed columnist, writer, and radio and television commentator who is well known for creating a media legacy. A member of the British House of Lords, he is a legend in the Canadian newspaper publishing industry. He built one of the largest media empires in the world, Hollinger International, and founded Canada's National Post. He has written books on Canadian and American history, as well as acclaimed biographies of figures such as former Premier of Quebec, Maurice Duplessis, and U.S. Presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and Donald Trump. <laughs> and we are very proud to say that he is now our own historian in residence for the Democracy Fund. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Conrad Black. And to join our historian in residence on stage as his special guest, a great Canadian in his own right, he is an acclaimed commentator, author, and Rhodes Scholar who currently writes a regular column for the National Post. He was a frequent guest on CBC's The National, as well as host of CBC Radio 1's Cross Country Checkup for 21 years. Born and raised in St. John's, Newfoundland, he graduated from Memorial University and later attended Oxford. Famous for his biting political commentary, his razor-sharp intellect, he's really, I think, a sort of a modern Socratic torpedo fish. <laughs> I might say. 
and his acrobatic vocabulary, all of which I'm sure you will see tonight. He is a legend in the broadcast industry and continues to keep our government, our journalists, and us on our toes. Please join me in welcoming Rex Murphy. better cheers than I have home. I believe it's I'm expected to begin and I want to start by thanking you all for coming and greeting those who are watching via the internet. And I particularly want to greet my friend Mr. Wakelin, a local candidate for school commission who for the second time in a row at a public event where I spoke came up to me and said that he had come to hear my jokes. I, I, I hope I hope I satisfy him tonight better than I did the first time. Uh, but I was assigned a rather sobering subject on that occasion. I thought, if it's agreeable to everyone, I would just, um, and particularly to you, Rex, I would just give a little background, very short, concise background on the history of civil liberties in this country. Uh, uh, just the general context of how that uh, subject has been treated in Canada. And then we can get on to particular points, more contemporary ones, which uh, Rex and I will, I think, probably have quite trenchant opinions that I hope most of you would agree with about them. Uh, Canada actually, and it's hard to believe it today, listening to all those claiming that we have a systemically racist society, uh, for opposing that view, by the way, I was fired from the radio station 640. I forget what the letters are. In, in the old days, it was Ted Rogers' station. That wouldn't have happened with Ted. But um, uh, I was fired, and my friend Mark Stein quit in solidarity with me because I said this was not a systemically racist country. And it isn't. It's one of the least racist countries in the world. There is... <laughs> Apart, I mean, no country in the world welcomes visitors from everywhere else in the world as warmly and open-mindedly as Canada does. And, uh, and there is no racism whatever in any system in this country. There may, and I guess there undoubtedly are, a few, very, very few isolated lunatics who could be called racist, but they aren't the system. They don't represent anyone, even themselves. <laughs> and uh, the point I'd like to make is that on the most burning issue of civil rights, uh, certainly in the 19th century and the continuation of it to some degree in the 20th century, slavery, uh, Canada's record is an extremely admirable one. Uh, you would not believe this if you listened, which would be something I would advise you not to do on any subject, to the former Chief Justice, Beverly McLaughlin, now I'm sure a great consolation to the people of Hong Kong as she defends their liberties. Uh, she said in, a, in an address given uh, wh when the host was the Aga Khan of all people, um, that Canada uh, was a place where slavery, as she coyly put it, had not been absent, and that we had attempted genocide, but cultural genocide, a concept that doesn't exist, by the way, uh, against the native people. And, um, and, and this is nonsense. Uh, slavery did exist in New France, but it was confined to under 100 people, and they were enabled under the French regime to emancipate themselves by a, <clears throat> by a program of seven years of indentured labor. So there were, as a matter of fact, uh, down to something like 15 so-called slaves when the British took over after the Seven Years' War. Uh, in, in this province, Upper Canada as it was, the first governor, as he, as he set it up on the orders of the governor, Lord Dorchester, Sir Guy Carleton, John Graves Simcoe, 
decreed ahead of everywhere else in the English-speaking world, and indeed the whole world as far as we know, decreed there would be no slavery in Ontario, and any slave in Ontario was automatically emancipated, which would not have been more than 20 people. And, and that was his position. That was in 1791 when Upper Canada, Ontario was established. And with the British Empire, uh, slavery, the slave trade was abolished, I believe, in 1807, and slavery itself in 1833. Now, we don't have to congratulate ourselves too fulsomely because the sole rationale for slavery was that African or Caribbean originated people were more efficient at bringing in tropical crops like cotton and tobacco and sugar, and we obviously didn't have any of that up here, but, uh, but that isn't the point. We had no slavery, and Canada became a self-governing entity starting in, with the so-called United Province of Ontario and Quebec in 1848. It had been abolished in the whole British Empire 15 years before that, and in practice in Canada 50 years before or more. What was the Chief Justice talking about, and why did she say such things? I don't think I'm going to get an answer, and I can't offer one myself. Um, or at least not, not one adequately polite for such a distinguished occasion as this. Um, it, it, I, I, we'll, we'll get to the native people later. That is more complicated. And I, just my last word on slavery is that the only place where there was any was amongst the native people who enslaved each other in these terrible wars they had with each other. Um, that was not what uh, Beverly McLaughlin had in mind. In, in fact, Canada has, partly because of its officially by cultural nature. It, it, is, it is the only transcontinental bicultural parliamentary confederation in the history of the world. And by nature of that fact, it, it, it is obliged to be reasonably tolerant, at least compared to other countries. And, and, we, and we built on that. And uh, our record ha has been a good one. There, there have been bad things. And we'll, we'll get to the native people in a minute. But I, I'm going to hand over to to Rex, and I, I think he, I, I particularly invite him, maybe he doesn't want to do it at this point, but whenever he wants to, uh, <clears throat> enlighten us all a bit about this ludicrous series of events in Oakville. But I, I just make this point that um, when there have been issues in this country, we have dealt with them. Uh, there, there, the, the segregation of any kind was, was dealt with very effectively and comprehensively and spontaneously throughout the country. Uh, of course, we didn't have the legacy of slavery, so we mustn't make unfair comparisons with countries that did, like the United States. But there are those very active, very vocal, and almost impossible to get away from in this country today, trying to hang around our necks like a toilet seat the idea that this has ever been a slavery-supporting country. And I don't want to labor the point, but um, we get that I in other areas. And I would just mention two that are very contemporary and which are, I'm sure, as aggravating to most of you as they are to me. We have been duped by the native victimhood industry. I bet that... <clears throat> I would bet that the great majority of you would feel pretty much as I do on this issue, but I, I suspect that many of you would not be aware, because you certainly wouldn't guess it to listen to Murray Sinclair and these others constantly um, rubbing our noses in our supposed misfeasances, that uh, in respect of the residential schools, $4.6 billion of reparations have been paid. $4.6 billion, uh, and, and the total number of people who attended these schools in all the time that they were in existence was something like 150,000, and, and of course most of them would have been dead by the time we, we got to the reparations, but that is not exactly a stingy response to the complaint about schools. Most of the people who attended them, schools of which most of the people who attended them said that they had their faults, but they were the only reason that they got on in the world. They were taught to read and write, which would not have happened if they hadn't been taken out of the grinding poverty of their families. I am not whitewashing the schools. 
I think almost all Canadians feel we have to do better with the natives, and we do. But the answer is not, as the present regime in Ottawa has done, to wallow in the past misdeeds of others, allowed the founder of this country, John A. Macdonald, who even in the time of Lincoln and, and Disraeli and Gladstone and Bismarck was a great statesman and was seen to be one by them, not Bismarck, but the others all had a very high opinion of him. And, and to represent him as virtually indistinguishable from Hitler. And it, it is simply an outrage. And I, I'll, I'll conclude for the moment on this. If we're not careful, we are going to allow the native victimhood industry to finesse us into acquiescing in the theory that the arrival of the Europeans in this country and their successors, the waves of settlers and, and uh, colonists who came after, was qualitatively indistinguishable from what Hitler and Stalin did to Poland. There were only 200,000 natives in all of what is now Canada. They didn't occupy the country. They were nomads moving around it. And no, that isn't what we did. And the fact is, this country would not have been utilized properly in all its potential if there hadn't been a great deal of immigration to it. Um, so, um, it's out of character, but I will subside for the moment and ask Rex to take over. Well, first of all, uh, this is going to be a technical question. Uh, I'm not sure how, I'm not used to these things. Uh, I worked at an organization that frowned on any overt manifestations of competence. <laughs> but the question still is serious. Uh, I know up here I can hear it, but is, is it okay? Does the sound travel? Oh. Closer? Yeah. See? As I told you, I worked for a long while at an organization that frowns on overt signs of competence. Uh, the second thing I have to say is that uh, this is not an ordinary occasion for me. Normally, without boasting, I think I can say, I'm not normally too intimidated, but sitting here across from the Encyclopedia Britannica, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever seen a, a spruce tree in Newfoundland. They, they get so stunted by the onshore winds that they don't grow vertically, they grow horizontally. They slide across the land. Uh, me sitting here now next to Conrad is like a Newfoundland spruce tree compared to an English oak. <laughs> this is a very difficult chair to be in, very difficult. Uh, the reason that Conrad opened with some account of the historical nature of civil liberties in this country is because he knows about them. <laughs> I'd like to go somewhere else, and Conrad again is, is the magister and tutor of this occasion, but I want to start on something that's extremely current, and at least in the strange vagaries of my otherwise unsettled mind, uh, amounts to something that certainly is tangential to, but in my judgment, is actually central to civil liberties in the present moment. I expect that most of you have seen the two Hindenburgs that were attached. <laughs> <laughs> that, were, that were attached by some prosthetics uh, uh, to the gentleman that they call a, a tech master in Oakville. And you might, well, apart from the fact that it's both absurd and hilarious at the same time, it does, it does, I'm serious here, it does come to civil liberties. As I was talking with Conrad earlier, everyone is familiar with the executive power to limit civil liberties. We just had COVID for two years, uh, which was an iceberg going through the entire Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That's an exercise in the demolition of civil liberties. And then we had the opportunistic election and the Emergencies Act, 
uh, that was bringing the guillotine down and shredding what little value the charter did have. You're familiar with the abbreviation and amputation of civil liberties through the exercise of state power. But so what has this, 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 this circus buffoonery of displaced erotica in Oakville have to do with civil liberties? Well, it has this, because it's an illustration of a very, very big current, and I want to get Conrad on this, that we've seen for 20 years, that in the Western democracies, where free speech is not officially throttled, and in which, at, its be at their beginning, was the most worshipped central cardinal tenet of the entire idea of democracy, we have become accustomed by the infiltration and osmosis of political correctness to exercise a kind of internal restriction on what it is, not what we think, but to say what we think. And that began with this whole thing that there became a certain set of subjects. Conrad just blasted one of them now to talk about the Indian residential schools in the manner that he just talked about it is an exceptional circumstance because the majority of the citizenry in this country, for Partly the reason that I'm saying there's this cloud of correctness came over us. And then we had a second thing. This is the worst thing that's happened to us, by the way, in the last 20 years. We have decided that instead of having the individual as, as the atom of the, democratic of the democratic process, that under the guise of these, these ridiculous diversity, inclusion, and equity false trinity, that we measure, we measure rights by designated groups. And by the very fact that you have designated groups, it means you have undesignated groups, and that there is not an inequity, there is a measurable inequality in the operation of civic power and civic license. And now I come, and you thought I forgot about it. I'm coming back to the Hindenburgs <laughs> in Oakville, what is transparently and to anyone with a functioning mind of more than four neurons, <laughs> there is something there that is simply, utterly wrong, ludicrous, possibly, I'm not saying it is, possibly perverted. But even, but even, <laughs> but even in Oakville, and I've talked with the par some of the parents that are there, the parents themselves who are, some of them are crying. I had an email today, I won't say from whom, of a mother that was crying because her children are going to eventually be in that school. But they are not speaking. And here's where I'm coming home. The fact is that because we've set up these categories, and because we've designated certain groups, and because we've put this business of capital D, diversity and inclusion, into some sort of almost sacerdotal status, that if it's a, an event that involves a trans person, well, I better not criticize that, because otherwise I'll be called a bigot and a racist, and I'll be attacked on Twitter and online, and maybe, maybe CBC will get my name and actually do a story on the actual thing. <laughs> so, here's the point. The administration of this new secular trinity is in operation, in its execution, a diminishment of the impulse to speak and to think. It is not mandated by law, but there's enough social and consensus pressure that people are not thinking and saying what they should. And thirdly, depressed that I'll leave it back. And thirdly, this, these particular set of doctrines, global warming, transgenderism, uh, sexual diversity, Environmentalism, my lord, my lord, the last great paganism of the world. On these topics, on these topics, the mainstream media also, also abridges the information, presents one slant. So how does that mean that our civil liberties are done? Well, it means that in Oakville, that in a democratic system, the parents would be speaking, but they're not. 
that those who are not committed to this new liberal, secular, woke trinity are not going to criticize it. They're afraid to say diversity may be just as much malign as benign. We have a system set up where there is a soft tyranny of subjects you can speak about and subjects you can't. And there's a set of subjects on which the state and the press have decided to agree. And on those, there's either no discussion or if you challenge the thesis of those things, you are either a racist, a bigot, or in my case, and I wear it proudly, a demented <coughs> climate denier. I deny it. Needless to say, I agree with everything Rex has just said. <laughs> and, and I want to um, I want to build on it a bit. Uh, the fact is, and I don't want to make this a particularly partisan occasion, but uh, we only have the government we have in Ottawa, and uh, they've had uh, an astonishing and shaming fact, three consecutive terms now, or three consecutive elections, even though in the last two they got fewer votes than their chief opponents. But their entire program, as far as I can see, has essentially consisted of a gross misrepresentation that is virtually a blood libel on all of us on the matter of indigenous issues. The a, a, a hysteria about climate that is reminiscent of the 17th century Dutch tulip madness where people were selling tulips for $25,000 each. Just a, a mass hysteria on, on a, 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 a fixated object uh, without any comprehension of what, you know, what the real facts are as far as they can be ascertained. And third is this rubbish of gender issues. Uh, the whole gender issue argument is nonsense and we are, as we all know, now reduced to the unspeakable absurdity that any of us could uh, you know, report to any organization that we attend, a workplace or a social or a church congregation or anything, and announce that we self-identify as Martians and we have to be taken seriously in that. Uh, although, in, in, not in this place, but th those who have brought those conditions around might make it on that claim. But, uh, yeah, but, but the, um, the, the fact is, the answer to the whole gender issue is there are only two sexes. There are only two. But the sexuality of each individual is up to that person without coercion or offense to public decency to work out for themselves. That's the issue. And people should be able, everyone should be able to fit in. And I mean, unless they're just extraordinarily sociopathically deranged, they shouldn't have any problem with those guidelines. And all people within it must be tolerated and their rights must be respected. But we shouldn't be going on with this nonsense. Our fr friend Rex is in mind, Jordan Peterson, being harassed and basically driven out of the faculty of the most esteemed university in this country uh, and, and uh, because he declined to conform to an, uh, a, a range of uh, pr pr uh, pronouns that he was supposed to use in describing people who self-identified in irregular sexual orientation. Okay. Um, the, the, um, this is just nonsense, and it's scandalous that a G7 country has wasted so much time bobbling this issue. I'll just go back to the natives for one more thing, because this, this is a real matter of civil liberties to all of us. There is no evidence whatsoever that official policy in this country was ever motivated by hostility to the natives. There is no doubt mistakes were made. No one can say we haven't atoned for them. But I, again, would be surprised and impressed if most of you were aware that there is still sitting out there with the ostensible statement in general by all major parties that they wish to enact its general recommendations, the recommendations of the 1996 uh, Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. It was set up by Brian Mulrooney, but reported out after he'd retired. That 
commission, amongst other things, recommended that one million square miles, a third of the entire territory of Canada, be carved up into various First Nations, sovereign nations in a confederacy between themselves, exempt from federal and provincial taxes in this country, and entirely subsidized and paid for by the taxpayers of the country. This is insane. It is, in fact, what the late Malcolm Muggeridge used to call the great liberal death wish. And it, it, no one has had the effrontery to try and enact it, but there can't be any doubt that that's where some of these native leaders are trying to lead to. We invaded their country, like Hitler and Stalin invaded Poland, and this is what they should get. And, and let, let us remember, in that as well, is the theory that the arriving civilization was, uh, was entirely on a par with the one they discovered here. No one's talking about superiority of people. The natives are the equal of us and everyone else. No question of that. But some civilizations are more advanced than others. The native society discovered here was nomadic. It hadn't discovered the wheel. It had no written language. It had very little agriculture. They lived on fish and game, except for a few places. They had very few permanent structures. And, uh, and, and, and the people who arrived, whatever the failings of the settlers and the failings of Europe itself were, uh, uh, people who had come from the civilization of Shakespeare and Descartes and Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, this is all nonsense. We're being labored by self-demeaning nonsense. And, and, we, and as Rex has said, any of us, including both of us, who actually say that it's nonsense have to prepare ourselves for, I mean, I'm fairly perverse, and I've been around the track a few times, and it doesn't bother me particularly, but we get a degree of um, abuse and mindless, half-witted, uh, and frequently defamatory condemnation that is no intellectual display of strength by our cultural and ideological enemies. That's who we're dealing with. And they're not all that distinguished, most of them. And as we're about to get to, one of the threats to our civil rights in this country is the utterly, unacceptably incompetent performance of 90% of our media. As most of you would know, I was the co-owner of a great many newspapers in a number of different countries, and in all of them, uh, we always tried to separate reporting from comment. Everyone was welcomed, unless they were completely mad, to put in any comment they wanted as long as they signed it as their opinion. Uh, but uh, there is nothing left of that that I can find in this country. I don't know what the editors do for a living other than just get in the ads and the text that they, that they can and put them in the space they have. Because nobody supervises the reporters and, said, uh, and says, so you know, that uh, in, in a reporting story on a speech by a politician that the speaker is an imbecile and his address is a tissue of lies from A to Z, that uh, that is actually a comment rather than an act of reporting. We just don't have it anymore. And, it, you know, it's the old, uh, much uh, apl applicable expression, garbage in and garbage out. And ultimately, we're not going to have an informed electorate unless we have a higher standard of media integrity. <laughs> my, I, I'll hand back to Rex, but I, my... The proudest moment as a newspaper proprietor and publisher was when Neil Kinnock was the leader of the Labour Party in the UK, the leader of the opposition. Uh, he and I were attended a luncheon at the Israeli uh, ambassador's house in London, and I offered him a lift in my car. I, I, I had a driver, and so I said, you know, Neil, come on. And he started down the sidewalk. And, I said, you know, don't, no one's going to see you in a Bentley. Don't worry about it. We won't scandalize the Labour Party. Don't pretend you're walking back to Parliament. Get in the car, for God's sakes. And he, he did. And he said, look, I want to tell you this. I know that you are a fanatical supporter of Margaret Thatcher. And I know the 
we're not going to get any favors from the Telegraph when the next election comes around. But the first parliamentary reporting I read every morning is in your newspaper because it is the fairest in the past. Now, Neil Kinnock is, uh, Neil Kinnock is no giant of British history, and he's, I think, chiefly remembered as being the person whose attack video was cribbed by Joe Biden. Uh, all that business about how we're the first person in our family in a thousand generations who went to a university, to which we replied, by the way, that the, uh, the prejudicial admissions to universities policy of the Cro-Magnons was very notorious. But, uh, <laughs> but that was that, I felt, and I told him this, and I told our editors that, very, very flattered that he would say that, because that's what we need. Thank you. Well, I, I do think uh, this business of newspapers, which we could use as an autonomy for all forms of media, are, I unfortunately have polluted my existence with 40 years of association with it. Uh, but having no life, it doesn't really matter. Uh, one, uh, one thing, without rhetoric, without any false raising of, of, of anger or rage that is truly sad and again it's not directly on civil liberties but in a sense uh, it is at the very center of the integrity of the functioning of democracy and therefore is about civil liberties is that the press and I don't know exactly when it began but I, I, if it were me uh, I'd pick when John Kennedy got elected. And I would go a little further then uh, when Nixon, uh, who was another demon figure, one of the first big demon figures of the press. And when they, when they make demon figures, incidentally, or when they, when they decide that such and such is a demon figure, uh, sub so, elements of the press then saw that as a license to abandon the strict canons of accuracy, uh, double quotation, a double certification of fact, and in fact, objectivity itself. This came, by the way, on, in parallel with the introduction of very relativistic, not Einsteinian, relativistic standards of truth, but that's a big one. As we move further into the 70s and 80s, uh, the, I'm still on American politics. When Ronald Reagan came uh, to reign, it became, in his particular case, he wasn't demonic, uh, but he was supposed to be lobotomized. Uh, he was referred to as a dummy, as a person who thought he was still in his own movies, etc. And the characteristic of the democratic or liberal press was, because he is in some ways another kind of strange figure, we're released from any moral constraints that obtain in the objective practice of journalism. And now we come right to the, to the last 20 years. And it, it, with Bill Clinton, with Bill Clinton, I think the virus decided that, okay, it's now time to spread. When Bill Clinton gave his most famous declaration of all, under oath, when he said, it depends on what the meaning of is, is. <laughs> and the fact that in, a, in the majority of the press of that particular time, that, I don't know what to call it, that oxymoronic, uh, you know, empty, vacant, it said nothing. It was still treated as a possible answer. And for a whole year, a president robbed the office of its dignity. I'm going to leave all these lurid details alone to a degree that the office had never been robbed of its dignity before. And he lied. He lied for a whole year. Yeah, well, that was the beginning. Then we've turned into the, this part of this century, and of course it became, at a nuclear level, 
when I think Mr. Obama came to the throne. Mr. Obama for almost a whole year. This, was, this is very important because Mr. Obama was looked upon as a serious, dignified, intellectual, and moral creature. That was a lot of his prestige. It really was. And he was selling the great health care plan. And they had those, that, that trinity of promises that if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your hospital, you can keep your hospital. If you like your health plan, you can keep your He said that, I don't know the number of times, but it's 75 or 100. And it's all on film. It's all on film. He said it intensely into the lens of the camera. It was a lie. It was simply not, not, not a falsehood, not a trip over, not a misspoke. It was a lie. It was a definitive declarative lie repeated on film and the, and the majority of the press in the United States and a lot of it up here decided oh that's the kind of lie that we don't report as a lie and when it became apparent that it was a lie and that people were paying fantastic things they couldn't when the system broke down when the computers went nuts that was the most direct lie involving one of the hugest, most expensive programs that the United States government ever involved itself in, spoken straight to camera by a person of supposedly celebrated integrity. The press went along with it. And now, as I said, we expect about nuclear, then we come to thermonuclear. <laughs> there was a man called Trump and he came down the escalator of his own tower. And at that point, the whole progress of the press, having left its base in 1965, 66, and through the 70s and the 80s, relaxing it even more, and then giving comfort and succor to a liar, Bill Clinton, as long as Bill Clinton was holding up the secular virtues. Remember the, the fact that Mr. Clinton was a feminist? that he was supporting abortion. And then I remember Geraldo Rivera, a, a, you know, a Plato for our time. <laughs> I remember Geraldo Rivera arg arguing on a panel saying that when it was all absolutely known that Clinton had done what he said so often he hadn't, everybody lies about sex. So suddenly we had an exemption, both from the Ten Commandments <laughs> and from the most important thing in journalism, that you tell the truth. Well, however, if you're lying about sex, then that's okay. <laughs> so also, if you're lying about your health care plan, you extend it. And when we get to Donald Trump, the New York Times actually said this, and it became the policy of newspapers, television stations, and especially the cable channels and CBC, that if you were reporting negatively on Donald Trump, there was no guardrail of integrity whatsoever. If a parrot flew by the window and said that Donald Trump had just slaughtered some baby lamb, then the parrot would be on the front page tomorrow morning. The press has become corrupt because it decides now that it is no longer a player. It is a part of the instrument of politics and it joins forces mainly with secular, woke liberalism. The press is not an observer. It is a participant in the game. This is a fact. I, wrap, I could go on this all night. I'll wrap this up in one big illustration. Because it is a scandal. Whenever Donald Trump, when, 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 when the, the, the great commission into his collusion with Russia, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump. I'm not. That, however, was a lie. Hillary Clinton, Christopher Steele, the Democratic Party, the FBI, the CIA, the manufactured dossier, this was all fed from the Democratic establishment. <laughs> and
And for three years, for three years, this was pumped that Trump was a stooge of Russia. And even if you stop for a second and say to yourself, hang on a second, he's the president of the United States. He could put Russia in his coffee. He doesn't need Putin. But this was a, a fiction, a narrative that the press decided it was going. And CBC up here and CTV up here, they went day and night. They were as bad, and this is saying something, as CNN. <laughs> now, here's the contrast, then I'll pass it back. Because this is the scandal. Just before the last election, which was very tight, it was discovered that Hunter Biden, a master of his own destiny, as very few are, <laughs> had left his laptop to be repaired. And with the tenacious and, 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 and tendentious memory that only his father shares, <laughs> he forgot it. He forgot it for a whole year. He's only the son of the then vice president running for president. And he has on that laptop material that you wouldn't be able to take to an Oakville school. <laughs> the New York Post, a paper of standing and the oldest newspaper, I think, in the United States, got information on the laptop, A, that it was genuine, the photographs were not tampered with, and they were disgusting. There were, rec there were obvious indications of dealings in Burisma and with China, not to mention, as I said, a pornographic record that would embarrass some of the people that are already in jail. Twitter, Facebook, Twitter decided to suspend the account of an American newspaper two weeks before an election. Suspended the story from the internet. Facebook followed next. This is two weeks before an American general election. Two things. It is impossible to believe that if Donald Trump Jr. had left a laptop with the same gallery of acrobatic exhibitions <laughs> and evidence that he was being paid $50,000 a month from companies in the East and China and that his father was possibly part of it, that would, be, that would not only be printed in the newspapers and put on television screens, it would be dented into the pavement of all of North America. You would be reading it as you walk the street. <laughs> CBC did not cover the Hunter Biden laptop. 20, 50 former intelligence operators in the United States signed a joint letter saying that while they didn't know it was Russian propaganda. It had all the hallmarks of it. <laughs> About six months ago, it has been established beyond all doubt. A, the laptop is genuine. B, there are two more. That three million dollars went to Joe Biden, Joe Biden Jr. And there are, do you hear this at the same velocity and, and, and frequency as you heard about when Donald Trump stole the shoelace of some ballet dancer? No. I give you these graphic examples as a parable that when the press becomes part of the organization and drama and, and narratives of politics, when it binds its hands to those who are already in power, when it decides that this set of stories gets everything and this set of stories gets nothing, then you have a corrupt system. It's one thing to lament about the politicians, but if the press has any regard for its own conscience, it should look over. And I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying a few things here. I'm, I'm not a partisan despite what people may or may not believe, and I don't care what they believe. 
But I will say this, and I've seen it enough on the internet, it seems to me that at least a good portion of the Ottawa Press Gallery has come to the determination that its main function is to act as an opposition to the leader of the opposition. And any story that goes in a different direction, the biggest story now of a kind of gruesome nature is the one I began with, with, with the sex maniac in Oakville. That story is in the Telegraph, the, the Independent, it's on the BBC, it's in the New York Post, it's on the internet, it's been on Fox News, it's all over the world. Go home tonight, go to the damn Google, Put CBC, CTV, Global, Oakville, Trafalgar, High School, blimps. <laughs> and you will not get very much news. You cannot, you cannot conceal the information that people should have and claim to be oppressed. You cannot take sides and claim to be oppressed. And if you are concerned with civil liberties and the operation of a democracy, if the press is deliberately corrupt, or corrupt from simple inadequacy, then our democratic system will fall. I want to take up on a couple of the points that uh, Rex made, but I, I want to I do, I, I want to divide this intervention into two parts. First, I just want to say something more about the climate change issue. <laughs> this is, I mean, we all remember, uh, or I shouldn't say all of us, most of us remember uh, 30 years ago when the Cold War was just ending. The issue of the environment was really in the hands of authentic conservationists. Now, Greenpeace were very tiresome when they harassed American aircraft carriers when they came on goodwill visits and things like that. But, but they were authentic conservationists. So, uh, you know, so were the Sierra Club and these others. They cared about the environment. They were overzealous, some of them. And some were just, just eccentrics, like you know, bird watching clubs and butterfly collectors and things. But good people sincerely identifying with our environment which we all care about. With the end of the Cold War and the absolute rout of international communism, with, with, a, with a, an improvisation talent that I would never have suspected of them, the international left then crowded onto the ecological bandwagon and marched to the front of the bus and threw the driver out and started driving it themselves and have been attacking capitalism on the utterly spurious pretext of saving the planet. And that is the real power behind the international environmentalist movement. It's a harassment of industry in the name of saving the planet in order to defeat capitalism. And one wouldn't have expected a high level of political sophistication from the authentic conservationists, but, but they, are, uh, they are just dupes. And uh, we all care about the environment, we all dislike pollution. But fortunately, democracy, beleaguered though it is, is going to come to our assistance here. Because the electorates of all of the Western countries, in the, in the order of the importance of this issue as it rises up, will respond to the attack on fossil fuels and to the resulting vast rocket-like increase in the, their cost of living, the cost of getting their cars to move and heating their homes and so on. They're going to throw out the, the politicians responsible for this insane <laughs> preoccupation. On the American questions that Rex discussed, to some extent, our media, to a large extent, our media are just taking the feed from the US. The American media's performance in all of these issues, on Mr. Nixon, whom I knew, uh, and, and uh, uh, Julie kindly mentioned that I wrote a book about him, and Donald Trump, whom I certainly know, and, and Ronald Reagan, and some others, uh, and, and on a good deal of policy has been absolutely scandalous, disgraceful, and with that uh, panache and, and 
energy that is unique to America and its love of the spectacle. It has gone to extremes that we as cautious Canadians do not approach. Our media are just quietly, cowardly, invertebrate, dishonest and irresponsible. But the American media are, are, are ferocious. Uh, they, they, all, all serious countries have a mythos of sorts. And the American one is essentially the America of Norman Rockwell and Grandma Moses and Walt Disney. I don't mean Mickey Mouse, I mean you know, the wholesome communities and Davy Crockett and so on. And, and that exists, but it's really a facade. Uh, the real United States is a jungle. I, I know something about that. And, and it, is a, it is both a strength and a weakness. You have this tremendous level of productivity in every field, an absolutely uh, incomparably productive workforce, uh, and, and generally a tremendous motivation personally and in the citizenship that they hold. Um, but it also is a jungle which, like all jungles, is run by 30-foot constricting snakes and 700-pound cats and millions of innocent and relatively defenseless defenseless people are ground to powder in that system. I am not a socialist, but they could do better in the US. And that's not our problem here. But I, I, I have to agree with Rex. The fact is, I'll just give an example. Richard Nixon had his opponents in control of both houses of the Congress all the time he was president. Uh, when he came into office, there were riots all around the country, everywhere, every week race riots, anti-war riots, skyjackings, have been the assassination of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. For, you know, there, there were no relations with China, no meaningful discussions about anything with the Soviet Union, no peace process in the Middle East, and uh, the orders of the courts were to use the school buses of the school districts to take tens of millions of children from their district schools and bust them around metropolitan areas to get racial balance uh, in the school system. This is what happens when you let judges run the country. Well, Nixon ended segregation without recourse to that. He, when he came into office, there were 550,000 draftees in Vietnam. No exit strategy. No one knew what the hell they were doing there, including the trigger pullers. 200 to 400 were coming back dead every week. Nixon extracted all of them while maintaining a non-communist government in Saigon. He opened relations with China, triangulated great power relations, negotiated and signed the greatest arms control agreement in the history of the world, SALT I, in which, incidentally, the United States recovered nuclear superiority, which Kennedy and Johnson and Bob McNamara had given away. There were no riots, there were no assassinations, there were no skyjackings. And despite the hostility of the press, Mr. Nixon was re-elected by the greatest plurality still in American history, despite the fact that the electorate has almost doubled in size since his time. 18 million votes because of how outstanding a president he was. His was next to Lincoln and FDR's first and third terms, the most successful term of any president in history. Does anyone know that? Does anyone know it? Except Nixon specialists who approach the subject with an open mind. I, I hate rhetorical questions, so the answer is no, nobody does. And we have the media to thank for that. Uh, I, you, you've talked about the Russian Trump thing. I mean, can we just focus for an instant on, on how close to the guardrails the American system is getting when you have the former director of national intelligence, Clapper, who, and he and Brennan, the director of the CIA, both lied to Congress, never prosecuted, Never even a slap on the wrist. They finished their terms. Uh, uh, Clapper announced the national television and a speaking tour he took all around the Western world that the incumbent president, Donald Trump, was a Russian intelligence asset. He said, I, I don't suspect that. I, it may happen. Some say it. Nothing like that. He stated as a fact, you know, like saying uh, Boston is the capital of Massachusetts. I mean, it's just a fact, you say. And, and, uh, I won't dwell on this because Rex summarized it extremely well, but we should reflect on the fact that the Deputy Attorney General, both Sally Yates and Rosenstein, uh, the Director of the FBI, Comey, 
other prominent officials all signed these false affidavits, which they knew to be false, to get authorization under FISA warrants for illegal telephone intercepts of the Trump campaign and the Trump transition team after he'd been elected. Anything happen to any of them? No, nothing. Well, I'm not, and I hope none of you are here to bash America. I'm actually, despite the fact that there are few people in this country that would have a greater reason to have grievances against that country than I do, but it is a great nation. It is an incomparably great nation, but it is what it is. Now, it's a democracy. They can run their country any way they want, and it's no one else's business. But can you imagine the credibility and the credit that the, that the Canadian media would get, since we're sitting here, we have a ringside seat on the vast drama of the United States that no one else has. If we actually put out, on one hand and on the other hand, reporting about the United States, uh, and, and we, we have the ability in this country to get our media into the American media. Not as great as theirs to do the reverse, but we have it. It's an, it's an opportunity for our media, but oh no. Our media are parrots, witless, hopeless, stupid, incontinent parrots on domestic and foreign affairs. Well, I'm going to uh, suggest that uh, Lord Black take a few minutes and come back on the same subject and, and let us know what he really thinks. Uh, there's only five minutes left, and it takes me that long to say hello. <laughs> but I will, I want to just show two or three things, and I'll pass it back uh, to the master here. One of the things that is most worrisome about our system is that we have so much, in relative terms, comparative terms, so much comfort, so much ease, so much freedom from catastrophe and disaster, war, famine, the things that plague the majority of the countries of the world, and certainly, are the entire canvas of history. I mean, even three or four generations ago in Canada, your grandfather, great grandfather, great grandmother, great grandma, <laughs> they knew work, toil, exposure, danger, lack of health. They knew Newfoundland, 1930s. We have got so cozy, we've got smogger, lazier, condescending. We don't value the things that built the place we now live in at such a high level of civilization. <laughs> Secondly, by a process that I, I can't fully analyze, we have allowed an ascension of entirely secular, I'm using that not in opposition to religion, but just as a definition, of secular, secular assumed virtues to approach the level of sacrament. This, this trinity of diversity, inclusion, and equity is just a string of goddamn syllables. But when you hear people talking about it, it's like the 14th century, you know, Aramites visiting the Vatican. This, this is a very challengeable set of things. And because it's become so tight, and because the media does not do anything except applaud, support, and libel those who question it, we're approaching stages of lunacy that we're looking ridiculous in the rest of the world. Listen, we cannot have school boards continue to abandon the whole idea of education so that they give them themselves the power to shape minds according to their tiny minds. That's the problem. Final thing, and I'll be very short. We are in a democracy. It isn't Russia, it isn't China, and thank God it's not North Korea. We are self-schooled in this idea that we shouldn't say things. I, I have no patience when I hear someone, especially in the media. Uh, if you have a large family, maybe it's different. But I can't say that because I might get fired. Well, who cares if you... <laughs> If, if you love your own integrity, if you love your neighbor, if you love your country, and if you are religious, if you love God, you say what you must say, 
and you don't weigh it against something else. We're right down to the end. I'll be very brief. I just want to set out a, a hopeful idea. I, I think, you know, if we, if we accept in general, I, I know I've waffled a bit and understated it and been unclear in what I think, but uh, if, if, we, uh, if we could get a general consensus, and the question was put, well, what, where do you start trying to make it better and fix it up? I believe we have to start in the schools. Uh, to me, the greatest, the greatest irony in modern affairs in our, all our Western democracies is that we spend more and more and more on education and get less and less well-educated graduates. The, the universities are largely unemployment deferral or avoidance operations. We run up huge fiscal debts and individuals, especially in the United States where tuition is much more expensive, run up great personal debts, which they then of course are agitate politically to be liberated from, uh, in order to graduate astounding numbers of people in fields from which they are incapable when they graduate of making a living. Uh, you know, with stupefying numbers of graduates in gender studies and this kind of thing. Well, we've got to start all over again. We have to start in the public school systems. These aren't schools at all, they're daycare centers. You all have seen, and probably many of you have been victims of it as, as parents of school-aged children, of, of how our teachers' unions blackmail the parents, blackmail the school boards, uh, and, and hold, the, hold the children, in effect, as hostages, or young people, and, and uh, strike for no reason, agitate for pay packets that are absurd. And we saw it all through this COVID crisis, where the teachers' unions were in lockstep shoulder to shoulder from coast to coast, saying that it was a menace to their health, no matter how heavily masked they were, no matter how people were vaccinated, no matter what the numbers showed, uh, to actually go back to school. Well, we're going to have to get rid of the teachers' unions, incentivize good teaching, and make a commitment to it. So we, we, I wanted to end on a optimistic note, despite the fact that I, I like you, all plenty to complain about. I'm not a pessimist at all. Uh, and I, by the way, I think Trump will be back in the White House. I'm, I'm here to cut off your speech. You can just uh, call me Justin Trudeau. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both so much to the oak tree and the spruce tree, or should I call you master and, wait, let me get this, demented climate denier? Grasshopper, grasshopper. <laughs> Thank you so much to you both. You know, this is exactly what free speech looks like. This is exactly what it looks like to have a discussion with an informed, alert, people whose minds are working on a regular basis and talking with one another, even though I suspect occasionally you disagree, but, <laughs> but you agree about the important things. I hope that this gave some of you insight into Canada's history of civil liberties and where we are now. I hope it also gave you some hope and a little peek into the legal work of TDF and I want to thank our audience, everyone who's here tonight, and especially those of you who are joining us from home on Zoom, our stars of the evening, Conrad and Rex, our special guests in the audience, our hosts, Charles McVitie, and everyone at Canada Christian College, the incredible team at TDF, who I have to say just works tirelessly behind the scenes to make everything you saw tonight happen, and for our enduring donors, of which we're just incredibly grateful. Our legal work, as you heard tonight, is entirely supported by your donations, and every day, 
in little and big ways, our legal team is the David to our country's Goliath. And we want to be able to continue to do this incredibly important work, but we can't do it by ourselves. And so if you feel moved by what you saw tonight in this incredible discussion that's part of the, our education work, and it, you heard from Alan firsthand the legal work that he and our other lawyers are doing and our paralegals are doing every day, um, please consider donating. Every single dollar matters. Um, all the donations are tax deductible. And you'll notice that you have little cards, I believe, under your seat. And if you're interested in making a donation, I think some of, we had to add some seats at the end, so not everyone has one. But either way, if you want to make a donation on your way out or on your way to dinner, uh, that you can do so when you exit these doors. I believe there's a table on the left. It should be pretty obvious where you can do that. Also, for those of you who have a dinner ticket, the dinner's unfortunately sold out. I'm, whole, I'm told that it's very delicious. So if you come back to another event, you'll want to make sure you get a ticket for that. But you go out the doors, turn to your right, and go into the little room where we had the reception. And thank you again so much to everyone for coming tonight. Safe journey home. Hope to see you at one of the next events. And take care.